This morning, uh, this is for Sunday school, um, we looked at John chapter 12 and looked at many different uh, characters in John chapter 12. The focus was on Jesus. All of these people had their focus on Jesus. There was uh, a time after Lazarus had been raised from the dead, so he was alive again, but it speaks about all these characters. They come to this place called Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem, and how that um, many people were there for Jesus, but many came not only for Jesus' sake, but also for, to see Lazarus because they'd heard how he was risen from the dead, how Jesus had raised him from the dead. And they were pretty interested in what was going on. And many of them, the, according to the Pharisees, they wanted to kill not only Jesus, which was the previous chapter, but this chapter had said that they also had decided they wanted to kill Lazarus too because by him, many people believed on him which is really dumb. If they try to kill him, Jesus probably raised him from the dead again. <laughs> but uh, so it spoke about Mary. Again, she was, uh, sorry, Martha, she was serving at this feast, at this supper. Mary, again, you find her at the feet of Jesus, this time further down on her knees. And she was using her hair to wipe Jesus' feet with a pound of spikenard. Then there was Lazarus. Where was he? At the table with Jesus. On top of that, you, you get the many uh, Jews who had been there probably uh, in sympathy to these women's brother dying and uh, they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, they came to this feast as well. Many of them were there. Uh, because of what Jesus had done, they knew that he was a special man. Many believed. It says that, the, um, that there were many, even though Jesus did many miracles, still they did not believe. And then a little bit further down it says they could not believe because Isaiah said that the Lord had hardened their heart that they could not believe. Why would that be? Well, we find that uh, we mentioned how that uh, Pharaoh, God hardened his heart. But why? Firstly, Pharaoh hardened his heart because when Moses came, uh, he was commanded by God to go back to Pharaoh and, and say, the Lord tells you, Pharaoh, to let my people Israel go. And what did Pharaoh answer? He said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? That was his first response. The next time you see... The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So we remember and we look at that and consider these people who had hardened hearts and that God hardened their hearts to the point that they could not believe because they would be deceived and be led to believe a lie. We can probably safely conclude that they already had hardened their heart to the point where God says enough is enough. And we've got to be careful for those who are not saved don't say no to the Lord. You listen, you research if you still don't understand or still don't know and, and you find out who Christ is and what he's done for you because he paid for your sin on the cross. Now, Jesus also said in that chapter, he's not going, he, he didn't come to condemn you, he came to save the world. But the one who's going to judge you at the last day will be his word because he tells you how to be saved in this book here, in the scriptures. Right, we're going to be looking at John chapter 13 tonight. And be, uh, before we begin, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the many things that are in this book of John. And Lord, for the things that he brings out for us to glean from and to learn from, Help our hearts to be soft, Lord, and pliable, that you would take our hearts and use them for your glory. Change us, direct us in the way that we ought to be going. Help us, Lord, to understand your word. And Lord, I pray that you would see fit to use us for your kingdom's sake. We do ask, Lord, help us to learn tonight that we might not um, be built up in pride, but that we would be humble and that we would learn these principles even a foot washing while, uh, Lord, we're, we're looking at it tonight, but help us to learn to be servants for, the, for you, Lord. 
We do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should be depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now that's an important verse. It's, it puts us in a setting. It shows the love of Jesus to his disciples and to those who loved him, right? Uh, it shows his love is very strong towards them. Now, Jesus knew that it was the time that he should depart unto his father. What's he talking about? It's his death. The previous chapter in chapter 12, he also prophesied that he would, be, that he would die and that he would depart, that he would be lifted up. And other people were asking him about all of these things. What does he mean by all of this sort of thing? Uh, we find in verse 2, it's Simon's son who would betray him. What's his name? Judas, right? That's sad, isn't it? Did you know that Judas was Simon's son? As far as I understand, that's Simon the disciple because the disciples are largely spoken about here. You know, there's, some of us are going to go through some big heartaches when our children may depart from the faith or not be in the faith and you might have thought they were in the faith but like Judas, his cloak was pretty good on the outside but on the inside he was like the ravening wolves just like the Pharisees, wasn't he? Okay, so here supper was ended and the devil now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Did you know something about the devil? He can't do anything. If you look at the, the life of Job, he can't do anything to anybody without God say so. My guess is that Judas was largely like the Pharisees and different people in the chapter before who had hardened their heart, even though they had plenty of uh, evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. And there's numerous times that he says that I am. And that's the I am that uh, was way back in Abraham's time. Okay, so when he says that I am. Actually, to Moses, he said, um, like Moses was scared, and he said, well, who, who shall I tell Pharaoh that's, that sent me? And... God told him, I am. Tell him, I am has sent you. He is the all-existent one. The, the, he's always been here. Okay, I am. So here, Jesus in verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Now that's interesting. Anybody here with sandals? Oh, Gail. <laughs> Gail. Oh, I've got to run in here for a little bit. Won't be long. <laughs> right, what does it say? Who can read the next verse for me? Caleb, can you read the next verse for me, please? Oh, I think it's about four. Oh, we've got a hole in here. What? Now, maybe I just missed. Well, I don't know if that happened back then. Oh, look, she's even taken her shoes off, so she really does want me to wash her feet. Now, did you know that in those days they didn't have covered in shoes so much? Oftentimes it was a, um, it was sandals, maybe something similar to this. So Jesus, what he did, he got a cloth and he actually, I made it even nice and warm. Oh, thank you, Dave. You're so kind. Rightio. Woo! No, <laughs> not really. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, why did he do this is the question. I didn't... Thank you, David. It's not dried really well, is it? Yeah, it's good. It's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's a good job. Caleb, how would you like to dispose of this? <laughs> Otherwise, somebody will sit in it. <laughs> <laughs> here, better get rid of this too. Tip it all in here. Okay, that's another one for when you come back. <clears throat> Wake us up a little bit. <laughs> so he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself after that he had poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, I thought you would say, ah, oh, don't do that. <laughs> but I chose Gail, but uh, somebody else might have said, no, no. <laughs> they go and refuse. In verse 6 it says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash, not, uh, wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. What's he talking about? Right there. <laughs> the heart. He's talking about if we have been cleaned by God because it's the blood of Christ who, who washes away all of our sin, yeah? And he said, What I do thou, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. He was about to go to the cross. He's teaching these disciples some of the last things that they would hear before he went to the cross and died, was buried, resurrected, okay? Peter, in verse 8, saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and, and my head. He's saying, well, wash me all if I need to clean, be cleaned. Jesus saith unto him, and this is a really important thing too, he that washeth a wash needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Now, what's he saying here? If you've had a shower, right, but you had to walk the two miles from Jerusalem to Bethany where he was, you're going to get grubby feet because you've got sandals not covered in shoes. Pretty evident, right? And also, if it was covered in, you'd probably have sweaty feet. And he was showing himself to be lowly enough to do the humblest task there was to wash somebody's smelly, dirty old feet. But he says, you don't need to be completely washed because you're already washed. You only need your feet clean. It's because we can trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be our saviour. He has saved us and cleansed us from sin. And then you know what? From day to day, we go and trip up and do things wrong and we make mistakes because we are sinners from the very start, as in Adam, all die, as in Christ, many are made alive. Now, so Christ has paid for our sin, but we still sin. And hopefully that's getting less and less as we grow closer to the Lord, and it should be, because the Lord wants us to walk holy and close to Him. But we do sin and what are we instructed to do when we sin if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous what's an advocate it's a go-between so how to get to the father through jesus christ the righteous okay and he wants us to confess our sins if um If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By the way, that's not only to unsaved, it's saved people too. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even those ones that you don't know about or you've forgotten about, right? He wants to make us totally clean. He wants us to live totally clean. He wants us to confess sins on a daily basis, not to leave it and mount up a great big huge list and then blurt it all out to him and then next year we'll do the same. 
That's not what he's talking about. But actually, when he says here, ye are clean but not all, do you know what it's actually referring to? He's saying that not all of you people are clean. There's one of you that's going to betray me. And he talks about Judas again. Okay, what verse did we get up to? I'm talking and not reading. 11. I think we're up to 11. Right, yeah? For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Did you know that we are called to wash one another's feet? By the way, it's probably the first person I've washed their feet, <laughs> besides my children. <laughs> Okay, we're probably in a different society and we don't wear the same type of shoes, which is largely a thing. Uh, but at the same token, Jesus wants us to go out of our way to get involved with each other's lives at the basis level, to do things where other people might not want to and might not see fit to and might even despise it. He wants us to be a help. That is so interesting. For I have given you an example. Now, might I say that there's some, some churches that teach us that Jesus Christ came to be an example and we're to follow after that. And they're talking about if we follow Jesus' example, that uh, we'll go to heaven because of, no, 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 not at all. A person needs to be saved from their sin to go to heaven. But once they're saved from their sin, they're, they're looked upon now by the Father as clean, irrespective of the sins that may be committed. Jesus Christ has paid it on our behalf. So when he looks at me now, he sees the righteousness of Christ in me and he wants me then to be an example, just like he was an example for us, to love one another. Now it's interesting also, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye what? Did you know that your happiness is based on obeying Jesus right here? Did you know that? So that means if you are not involved with other people and helping them in their needs, you won't be happy. Is that fair enough to say? That's drawing a bit of a long bow, but I think we can pretty well say that. He goes on, I speak not of you all. Again, who's he referring to? Is one of you... And who's he talking to, by the way? Who's this group of people he's talking to? His disciples. There's 12 of them there, likely. I haven't counted them, made sure they're all there. But uh, as far as I understand, there's all of them there. But he says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. Remember, he chose the 12. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Here it is again. I am, and see the he is in italics. So he's saying that I am the self-existent one. Do you know that's in John chapter 5? as well? John speaks about it numerous times. John chapter 1. He presents Jesus Christ as God. In verses 1, Jesus is the Word. In verse 14, the Word was made flesh. The, the Word was with God and the, uh, and the Word was God in verse 1. In verse 14, the Word was what made flesh. But then uh, you go to uh, chapter 5 and verse 18, he calls himself the I Am. In John chapter 8 and verse 58, he calls himself the I Am. 
Verily, verily, in verse 20, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, what does that mean? Truly, truly. And you can just about hear the expression coming and bouncing off the page there. Truly, truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This is his disciples who he loved and one of them is going to betray him. Now you've got the 12. Just imagine you're one of the 12. You're in that group and Jesus tells you that. At the moment, we've got John, the writer, who Jesus loved, who was leaning on Jesus' breast. You've got Peter and other disciples there. And they've all just heard that one of them is going to betray him. And they're looking around at each other. <clears throat> Verse 22, then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. You know, in our church here, there may be people that you think are godly Christians. You may not know the underlying sinful heart of that person because we can hide our hearts really well. But God sees straight through a facade into the heart. Like um, Heather's um, her memory verse last week, about Samuel when he was about to anoint one of the sons of Jesse and he brings in Eliab. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. And what was the response? God tells Samuel, don't look on, uh, don't, don't look as man looks. Sorry, what's the verse? How's it start off? The, the Lord, nor on the height of his stature for, for God's, sorry, or on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. For man seeth, sorry, for God seeth not as man seeth. For man seeth not as God seeth. For, for man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Yeah. Right? God sees the inside of us. We can put on a facade to anybody. God knows the truth of our heart. So much. So they were looking around on each other, doubting of whom. So they had no clue as to who it might have been. Verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. He speaks like that of himself because I think he's a humble person. doesn't want to make himself a popular known person. He wants Jesus to be known. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him. What does that mean? He probably does that, something like that. So, Because everyone's wondering, who is it that's going to betray me? And so, ask him, ask him, so we can know. And uh, so that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Again, it says the son of Simon. Like back in verse 2, that's Simon's son. Therefore, I, I would tend to think that this is one of the disciples, that Simon. Otherwise, it would have to explain, no, it was this other Simon. So heartaches can happen to the best person, okay? Okay. <clears throat> and after the sot, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Get on with it. Do it quickly. Don't let it hang around. Don't let it last. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto them. For some of them thought, because Judas had, had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy these things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went, went, went what? In verse 30. 
immediately out. What did Jesus tell him? Whatever you do, do it quickly. He went immediately out. I wonder if he, he must have known that Jesus was talking about him. And I wonder if it was sort of half in obedience that he went immediately. And it was night. But remember, he had somebody driving him. Who was that? Who was, who was driving Judas? The devil had entered into him. Okay? <clears throat> and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. Why is that? Why do you think? You guys can't come where I'm about to go. Do you know where he was about to go? Disciples were about to ask that. Whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, and you, by the way, he's using this time. He knows he's about to enter the, the judgment of the cross, the judgment for the sin of the world. Yet he uses this time because he loves his disciples and he wants to teach them some of the most important things that they will learn. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Isn't that funny how it says it twice? That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Why did he do that? He is stressing an important factor. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Is that part of the reason why our churches are not growing? Because we forget about each other and we're not helping each other and we, we're not um, willing to, to get low for somebody else. This year is more important than most of us will realise. The importance of loving each other and being able to humble ourselves to do the dirty task for somebody else, for a needy person, to go out of our way for somebody else. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? So he did ask, so where are you going that we can't go? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Where's he talking about? Where do you think? The cross. Thou shalt follow me afterwards. It was Peter that was actually thinking of it now, was supposed to have been crucified upside down. That was Peter, wasn't it? One of the disciples was crucified upside down. It's interesting that he says, you can't follow me now, but shalt follow me hereafter. That's if he was talking about the cross or if it's talking about death more general and entering glory. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So he was letting Peter know and he was mentioning all the way little things that would happen in the process of time so that when they did happen, they would know and understand that Jesus is who he says he is. We're going to look up some other verses here now. We've gone right through that chapter. Please turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 39. Matthew 22. <clears throat> 37 to 39. I know you know these verses. They're very common.
Jesus said unto him, in verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Did you know that? So what are we to do first? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and in other passages, and strength. Right? That's the first commandment. In other words, it's the most important. Then it continues on, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Do you love yourself? You might think you hate yourself. But usually, if you put your hand in boiling water, what are you going to do? And that was pretty warm, wasn't it? (laughs) You're going to pull it out pretty quick. Why? Because you love yourself too much. I mean, not too much, but you do love yourself, right? But then it says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Pretty important stuff. We'll go over to Mark chapter 12, which is a, the same type of thing, but it adds another little aspect. Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> Verses 30 and 31. Well, actually, going back to 29, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I ask you now, how important is it to love your neighbour? You know, when Jesus tells his parables and he was telling a story of the Good Samaritan, you get the priest who walks past, you get the Pharisee who walks past, they see the, the um, person who's been beaten up and left for dead. What do they do? They look and they walk on the other side of the road, yeah, and pass by. Then the good Samaritan comes past. He goes and tends to the needs of that poor person, even though he was a Samaritan and they have no dealings with the Jews. And Jesus asks, which one was the neighbour? And the audience said, was the one who helped, right? Important to be a neighbour to those in need. There is no other commandment greater than these. We're told that we're to love our brother and if we say that we love him, yet we don't, what are we? We're hypocrites, aren't we? In 1 Corinthians 13, We can have all the doctrine. We can have all this other stuff. But without charity, what am I? A sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You know, James says that without works, our faith is dead. Do you know what people see in you? They see your works. They don't see your faith. They can see your faith in action, but how does it manifest itself? In works. So when you are humbling yourself and helping another person, and others see, and by the way, we don't go go around doing things just to be seen to people, right? That's not at all what I'm saying. But when people see they understand that we've got a different heart for things because Christ is involved. And they see Jesus in us because this is being obedient to Jesus. Jesus showed us an example of this in the foot washing and making a puddle there. (laughs) So it's very important to go the extra mile to help people out And this is for a Christian, 
to be obedient in this area of loving one another. So short service tonight, that's different for me, but that's what I have to give you. So let's close in a word of prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you that you are our God, that you have left us an example and that you've given us your word. Help us, Lord, not only to know your word, but help us to put into practice these principles that you so much want to be part of our lives. Help us, Lord, to be that testimony and shining light that you want us to be. Lord, make a difference in our lives. Help us to cling unto you, to know you, know you closely. Help us to have a right heart, as we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would use us throughout this week. Lord, maybe in little ways, just to be an encouragement to others, to our brother in Christ, that we might love each other and that others might know that we are your disciples. I pray, Lord, keep us from evil, keep us from sin. Help us, Lord, to focus on you, our dear Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.